Well, welcome to the recording for week two in computer fundamentals. In week two, you'll see it starts off with unit six, and even though it's, it's really unit one for us, but since this is a continuation of computer fundamentals A, that had units one through five, so this one's called six. But really, what it is, is you're right down here, you're in the unit called when all you have. You can see that there's Tuesday work and Thursday work. And the, I need to make a slight change on here. On the Tuesday work, you actually be turning in two files here. And CF unit 6 hyphen B. So you're going to be turning in two files on this project work. Okay, so getting back to that uh, week two, for Tuesday, you're going to do the Class Connect write-up. Then you're going to do these two little PowerPoint uh, shots that you'll turn in. And then for Thursday, you'll do a price comparison chart. Now, a couple of reminders. Right here, I have some project videos. Uh, here's a video on how to create tables and charts. That's going to be for project two. And here's a price comparison table. Gives you a sample of what your work should look like when you get to project two. If you haven't done week one work, please get week one work done before you jump into week two. Okay, thanks. Then finally, we have the um, how to be a successful online student. So go take a look at that. Find eight minutes to do that. All right, jumping into when all you have unit. And in this unit, we're going to talk about all the different tools you have for computers. So the first thing we always want to do is we want to look at the write-up. So as you, you know, by now you should know you do the write-ups. You highlight everything, control C to copy, paste in the word processor. And you can see I have the numbers included. Then you find the answers as you watch this recording. Type the answers in. You have all that stuff in your word processor, then you copy it, paste it as text in the Dropbox, not as an attached file. So in section two, the first two questions, what does it mean to have a toolbox to fix computer problem? List the three main Microsoft Office tools. So let's keep those in mind so we can answer those as we go along. So here we are in section one, or the introduction part. And this just talks about if you have a hammer, then all your problems are nails, meaning that if the hammer is the only tool you have, <coughs> you can only use it a certain way. So what you really need to do, just like a, a plumber or a carpenter uses certain tools to do certain things, when you're using technology, you use certain computer tools or applications to solve certain problems. Before I move on, I just want to apologize. I have a bad case of hay fever, so I'll try to get through this as best I can. So it's section two. So this talks about choosing the right tool. You know, have you ever had to fix something and you grabbed a screwdriver, it was either too big or too small, or was a slotted screwdriver rather than a Phillips screwdriver? Well, you didn't have the right tool to get the job done, right? Or about Tiger Woods in golf. When he won the U.S. Open or when he wins tournaments, he uses more than just a putter, doesn't he? Could you imagine if you're golfing and you have a putter right off the tee? You can't do that. Painters, you just use different brushes. So the idea about different tools in computing is that you find the right computing tool, meaning the right application or the right program to do the job right. For instance, if you want to crunch a bunch of numbers for a budget, you wouldn't use PowerPoint. You'd use Excel. So again, it's using the right computer application to get the job done that you need to do. That's what the right tool is, choosing the right tool. Now, this section is section two. We're going to analyze the problem, determine the tools for it, use different applications, and then use the right application for to solve the problem. Here's a little self-test go through. It talks about an artist and what the artist might use. So. <coughs> Go through that, see if you can get it right. Here's another one. See if you can get that right. It's just a little bit of practice. So here's a quick reflection. So if we think about computer fundamentals and computer tools, 
Of course, mostly we use these tools, documents, spreadsheets, and presentations. Those are most of the things we create. And of course, with Microsoft Office, you have Word that is for document authoring, Excel that's for spreadsheets and analysis, and then PowerPoint that's for presentations. Now, many of you might be using OpenOffice, and OpenOffice, of course, has a word processor to do this. It has a spreadsheet program to do this, and it has a presentation program to do this in OpenOffice. Here's another self-test, so go through that, read this, see if you can get the correct answer on it. Another one, these are just little scenarios just to see what you know. And it's a warm-up activity anytime you do work with technology. Some of the things you need to think about before you choose the right the tool is who's going to use your data. Will you present it or are you just going to share a file with someone? How much time will the reader have? So you're going to be real concise or could you, could you write out more information? One person or a group of people? Are the people all going to be in one place or across the nation? They all speak the same language. So those are things you need to think about when you do your work with technology. So to wrap this up, computer, you know, Windows users, lots of tools to use, uh, how to present information multiple ways, and need to consciously decide which tool or which computer application is going to be the best one to use. So let's go back to the Class Connect write-up and see if we answer the question. What does it mean to have a toolbox to fix computer problems? I talked about that. Then finally, and this does not mean having a screwdriver to fix your computer. Does not mean that. Make sure you answer this properly. Then finally, three main office tools used to create data, and what are they used usually used for? Well, there was a slide that talked about that exactly. In section three, explain what an elevator pitch is. Three main characteristics of a good tagline. Explain what the Goldilocks rule is. And explain what the Rudolph rule is. There's three ways to demonstrate the Rudolph rule. So now we're into section three. Section three, getting your point across. You know, there's no sense in doing work on computers and technology if you can't get your point across. Whether you're doing, right down here it says, whether you're doing a presentation, a doc, Word document, or an email, you would need to get your point across to your audience. So, you know, structure it to engage your audience. I mean, you make them excited about what you're saying. It should let them know why what you're sharing with them is important. Why is it relevant? And make your, your information interesting. So there's some of the things you need to keep in mind. In this section, we're going to look at how to effectively uh, communicate application through applications, how to process data and reports, and then look at appropriate applications for different jobs. Now, the executive summary. What this is talking about is how to be concise in what you need to share with somebody so they understand what you're saying. And this relates it to what's called an elevator speech. So, you know, look at this scenario. You're trying to get a, a job at a company, and you're in the elevator with the president of the company. You're going to the 10th floor. You have 30 seconds to tell her why she should hire you. But well, what are you going to say in 30 seconds? That's called an elevator speech. Now, in terms of technology and reporting information, what that means is what is the best way, the most concise way you can show people the information they need? What is the most effective way to present the information? That's what an elevator speech is. Now, even though you, are not, you won't be using elevator speeches, it still refers to any type of work that you do in technology. You want to do it the most effective way to reach your audience. And um, executive summaries, again, that's similar to the elevator speech, the best way to present something. So you can go here for a list of some of the great American books, and they have short executive summaries that tell you about the book. Taglines. Taglines are really important because they draw the, the reader in. They make the reader be interested in what you're, what you're saying. So let's look at these samples down here. There's one that just says research results. Well, does that tell you very much? No, it's pretty boring. But look at this tagline. Talk is find a link between gray hair and donuts. I would much rather be interested in reading that, especially since I'm over 50 and getting gray hair. 
I'd rather read this than read this probably. This one is more interesting. You can see it has a noun, it has a verb, and then it has non-scientific information. So that's a tag, what a tagline needs to have. So if we look at this, taglines have three characteristics. Noun and a verb, it has drama, and it uses scienti uh, less scientific words. If we go back to that example, this one does exactly that. So taglines are important as you could use them like in the title of a PowerPoint and then that will draw the people in, make them interested in what you have to say. The Goldilocks rule. Well, we know the story about Goldilocks, right? The porridge was too cold, the other porridge was too hot, and then the one she found was just right. The chairs were too hard, too soft, and then just right. So then this last one says, you know, she goes into the office, sees some documents, one report it was too long. And then she looked at the other report and it says this one is too short. Then she looked at the baby's report and this report is just right. So the idea about the Goldilocks rule is whatever your information is, make sure you present it just right for your audience. Not too much, not too little. So that's what the Goldilocks rule is. Presenting your information in a just right manner so people will uh, understand it. Now the Rudolph rule. Rudolph, we know, is you know the reindeer with the red nose that stands out and all of that. Well, Rudolph rule can be used in work that you do on computers. You want to make some data stand out on your slides. So you can use a different color for the text. You can make it bold. You can put a circle around it. There are lots of things you can do. So those are just three examples of what you can do with the Rudolph rule to make your information stand out. So you make important information stand out. So the summary, we talked about executive summaries or elevator speeches, how to write the right amount of information to get somebody's attention. We talked about taglines, and then we talked about, of course, the, the Rudolph rule. Now this all applies to this assignment. And in this assignment, you're going to create two one-slide presentations. One's going to be a boring one, and then one's going to have a good tagline. So first thing you do is pick a topic. So maybe your topic is going to be Grand Junction. Then you go to a search engine and you search for that topic and find three facts about that topic and make a one-slide presentation. So you're going to have the title text box. So I would have the text box would say Grand Junction. Then I'd have a bulleted list of the three facts that I found. Just one line for each of the three facts. And then I would use the Rudolph rule to highlight one piece of that of those facts, and I would save it with this name. Now, when you save it with these names, you don't have to put the PPT on the end because it will do it automatically. So there's the exact name you save it as. So this one, you know, in my example, it would be called Grand Junction, and I'd put the three facts, and I would Rudolph rule one of the facts. Then I'd take that same file, so once I have that saved as A, then I take that same file, but I instead of saying just Grand Junction, I make it a more exciting tagline using what I know about taglines. So you know, my I'm not even going to give it the example because I'd like you to. I don't want to uh, change your mind about what you're going to do, but you want to make a tagline that will draw people in, and then you. Uh, save that file as the B version and you turn in both of these. Now before you do this work on all these assignments make sure you look at how it's going to be graded. So if I go here I can see how this is going to be graded. So again for version A for version A you use the Rudolph rule and it has a boring a boring heading. Then in version B you make a tagline Instead of the name of your topic, you put a good tagline. And here's how you get graded on it. Don't turn anything in unless you've done all of these things to get the full credit. So that's the work you'll do. And you, again, you'll turn in the A version and you'll turn in the B version using those exact names to save them as. So that's this assignment. Now you can also see how it'd be graded. 
but that's the essentially the same information we just looked at. So make sure you always look at these of how you're going to be graded before you submit the work. Now let's go back to the Class Connect write-up. See if we answered the questions. Explain what an elevator pitch is. Yeah, we talked about that. What are the three main characteristics of a good tagline? You saw it in the presentation. Explain the Goldilocks rule. You saw that. And finally, for the answer for two questions, explain the Rudolph rule and three ways to demonstrate it. And I showed you those in, the, in that presentation, right? Okay, section four. How is a chart a useful tool? What types of tools do Microsoft Office applications have to help you work more easily? Explain why you need a legend on a chart. So now we're going into section four. So I'm right down here. Now in section four, we're moving into charts and uh, spreadsheets. And this is all we're going to do for this. Section five and six will be next week. So in section four, charts and graphs. Now a chart is a great way to represent numeric data and present large amounts of data in a simple way. So that's the usefulness of a chart, to easily represent numeric data and present large amounts of data in an easy way. So that's how a chart is used. And you know this says you're going to use Microsoft Excel, but if you use OpenOffice, you can also create charts. It has a charting program. In this section, we're going to look at how to organize or create charts, how to use the chart wizard, and how to place a chart in another document. So generating a chart is the easy part. First, you need to you know, compose your data. And here's some sample data. So what I would, this is going to be a chart about how gas prices have changed. What I suggest you do, because you'll be doing this for the work, Right now, open up your spreadsheet program and do this exact work, just like they have here. So in column 1A, you'll put the price of gas July 2007 through June 2008. 3A, you'll put the word month. 3B, you'll put average price. So make this chart as you go through this presentation. Do this exactly, because this is going to be the basis for the the uh, where the spreadsheet is going to be the basis for the chart you'll make in a little bit. So you'll enter all of this information, and you can see these are just numbers that they put in. So you're going to create, recreate this exactly like this. Then to create the chart, well, in Microsoft Tools, they have um, programs that are called wizards, applications that are called wizards. And these wizards help you do common complex things. In this version of Excel, they have a charting tool. Now, if you have a different version of Excel, you're going to need to look at something different for charting. For instance, I'm going to go ahead and open up my version of Excel. Now that I have my version of Excel open, I need to, mine is different, so I need to go up here at the top and find out where the charting tools are. So if I go to insert, here are the charting tools. So your version is going to be different, and I can't demonstrate every version. So you can see how this would put the chart information in and create the charts. So yours might be different. So that's the version of Excel that I have. Yours may, be, be, may look something like this for the chart wizard. Anyway, the wizards are to make life easier for you. So in this one, there you put in the chart then you check your data this is where you make sure that it's highlighting the correct set of data so you can see that this is highlighting all of the data from columns A and B and then it's going to create this chart so you're doing this you're creating this chart as you move along then you add formulas and titles so on your charting software, you can see where you add these titles and you add the, uh, uh, the different pieces that you need to have so people can understand your chart. Now the legend is really important in the chart because the legend can identify what everything means in the chart. So if you're in this version of Excel, 
and you would choose legend and then you tell it where to put the legend so you can see that this has the national average gas price and then the word price on the left over here so the legend is really important to show what the information is that the chart contains and then once you create a chart you can place it it'll just go onto your screen but then you can move it around easily too so in summary we looked here how to generate a chart how to format a chart by putting legend and titles and such and now here comes the assignment and this is based on the work that you did as you watch these slides now what it says You'll generate a similar chart, so you've worked on this one as you've gone through the slideshow, so you have a bunch of stuff already. And you're going to put your state average as well. Column B is going to be the national average. Make sure you change the heading to national average. Then column C is going to be state average. And you can either put your own data in, or you can search online to find actual Colorado prices. Then you're going to generate a line plot for the national average and a line plot for the state average and a legend. And then submit your spreadsheet. And I'll show you an example in a minute. So let's look at how you're going to get graded. So this tells you more about it. But you can see that the data columns are labeled properly. The state data is cited if you found a website for the state data. Chart has both lines in it. The legend is there. The month names are readable. Do all of that and you'll get full credit. So make sure you follow those directions on how you're going to get graded on the work. Now this, it doesn't tell you the file name to save it as. This is a Project 2 assignment. But if we go back to the, um, the work for the week, I tell you right here, you're going to save that as gas price compare. Gas price compare. Now the other thing to show you all over here, I'm going to go to project videos and sample screenshots. Here's project two. Here's an example of what yours should look like. So I'll open that file up. This is the one that I did so you can see. I put up here an A1 gas price comparison that I had the months. Had national price, Colorado price, and then I set it all up this way with the titles, the legend, so yours should look somewhat similar to this. Now, if you're having trouble putting the legends in and all of that, again, I can't help you with every version of Office or OpenOffice or whatever, so you may have to do a search on your version of Office and then find out how to put legend in, how to put titles in, and such. And here's a video showing you how to create that table in the chart. So I'm trying to give you all the tools to help you do this work more easily. Last thing I want to do, let's go back to the Class Connect write-up and see if we answered everything in Section 4. How is a chart useful? Yes, yeah, so I talked about that at the beginning, didn't I? chart is useful because it can uh, uh, show summaries of numerical information. What type of tools do Microsoft applications have to make your work easily? They're called wizards. Then finally, explain why you need a legend on a chart. We well, need a legend because it tells people what the information in the chart contains, the importance of that information, what all the colors and lines and things like that mean. So we've answered all of these questions in this presentation. And again, when you turn in these write-ups, it's going to be text in the Dropbox, not an attached file. So we've gone down through, all the way here through Project 2. Week 3's work is going to be down here. So we've gone all the way through Project 2 for Week 2, and we'll just I'll re quickly revisit the assignment, and we looked at all of this stuff. So right here, you're going to turn in two simple PowerPoints. Right here, you're going to turn in the price comparison document, and you're going to call it Gas Price Compare. And that'll be exactly like my, or not exactly, but something like this example that I posted for you. 
It should look similar to this. That would get you full credit. Okay, well, thanks for watching. I look forward to your work coming in. Just take your time, save things with the right file names, and you'll do great. Thanks, everybody. Bye.